Namaste. Welcome to Shaman's Shed. Today I am talking with Jonas from Cosmic Consciousness. He is a psychedelic consultant, facilitator and creator of YouTube channel Cosmic Consciousness with Jonas. Today we discuss a number of topics ranging from healing to evolution. A fantastic conversation today. We welcome Jonas to Shaman's Shed. Okay, so welcome today to Jonas from Cosmic Consciousness. Uh, thank you for coming on Shaman's Shed. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, I guess I'll start really then. You know, you, you've got a fantastic channel. Um, you know, there's some really clear sort of spiritual insight that you've, you know, accumulated over the years, um, you know, combined nicely with, you know, the use of psychedelics and meditation and things. Um, so I guess I'll start. Tell us a bit about yourself and, you know, where your spiritual journey started. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is really, I mean, in a lot of ways, the ultimate mystery, right, is the mystery of the self. And um, I think over the past probably 10 years of my life, I've explored on more and more deep, deeper levels how, how mysterious this really is. I mean, that was quite a revelation for me, to be honest, uh, ten, around 10 years ago when I sort of um, first started undergoing this sort of spiritual awakening. I think it started way earlier in my life as it does for all of us, you know, in childhood. I was always attracted to the mysterious, <laughs> those, those realms of, of, of knowledge and areas of exploration where um, it, it was sort of like on the threshold between the known and the unknown, you know, the UFO phenomenon, <laughs> uh, extrasensory perception, ghosts, uh, the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, all this stuff, you know, I was just, even as a young kid, I remember being just desperately curious about all these, all these things and wanting to know, um, but I was raised in sort of an atheist uh, background. I, I really didn't have a religious or spiritual upbringing. And, and I, uh, you know, as I, as I was here, as I heard you mention, grew up really as, as not, not an agnostic, but as an atheist, like a materialist. I was convinced that consciousness is produced by the complex interaction of neurons in the brain. There's nothing more to what we are than this physical human body. Um, and... Yeah, I think it was like sort of an interesting and, and gradual then rapid progression into seeing things in a very different way. Uh, uh, part, part of it was through some really interesting uh, lucid dreams that I had when I was in my early teenage years. And that sort of got me really thinking and exploring in new ways. But it was my use of, of uh, psychedelics, psilocybin mushrooms and, and DMT uh, that really just revolutionized and 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 fundamentally shifted my perspective on the mysteries of life and and the mystery of the self and um it was really in combination with psychedelics and and meditation and spiritual practice is why i think that these were really these subjectively were really profound journeys for me because i really was approaching it with that sort of meditative um and a certain sense of reverence and a certain respect for the sacredness of these medicines, you know, for whatever reason I, I, I had that. But um, I think psilocybin mushrooms sort of cracked the materialist egg open. Yeah. By egg, I mean my, my mind. It sort of yeah. opened my mind a little bit to greater possibilities. But it was really DMT that, uh, again, was this fundamental shift in my perspective where uh, I realized that there is so much more to the mystery of life and there's so much more to what we are than what is what we can see with our eyes than what we can perceive um, through a series of, yeah, it, it, it subjectively felt like out of body trips where consciousness or, or the essence of my being had left this body, this lifetime behind and had emerged in some sort of alternate realm or dimension, transcendent space that felt to be unbelievably sacred like that feeling of awe and reverence when you step into a holy place like a massive cathedral and you step in or in nature you know uh, that mountaintop experience where you're just looking at the view and just blown away absolutely astonished by the beauty the intricacy the complexity and the elegance of this miracle of existence unbelievable miracle and 
possibly the the deepest experience there was not what I was seeing kind of um I mean the 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 borders between outside and inside in those experiences sort of dissolve and fade away but it really was more what I was feeling than what I was seeing in the sense that I felt on a very very deep level a sense of oneness and unity and interconnectedness with all of life and all of existence you know this is sort of like the classical mystical experience which I hadn't ever studied up to that point but this was sort of the rapid like quantum shift in my whole perspective yeah. was like all of a sudden um these sort of supernatural or uh you know pseudoscientific that's what I would have called it before um before these experiences uh these studies of spiritual or religious experiences all of a sudden assume like a really central significance and importance in my life after those experiences, after I tasted, tasted it for myself. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's a really long winded mm -hmm. uh, answer to the question. Uh, the, the, the answer is really that like, tell us a little bit about, tell you a little bit about myself. Like, I, I think that really the most concise way to say it is that the self is is a mystery and uh, ultimately an expression of something way greater than this one human lifetime. On this human level, uh, Jonas, I am the creator of a, of a YouTube channel called Cosmic Consciousness with Jonas. I am, my background is in social work. Uh, I was, I have a master's degree in, in social work and was working towards becoming a, a, a licensed uh, clinical social worker, a, a psychotherapist. Um, but having had these sort of like entheogenic experiences, that's been my, my, my passion. I've had absolute clarity for years now that this is, this is my passion. And um, I was sort of working to, in that direction as well as sort of in the background. And I, I found an experience or sorry, I found an opportunity working at a, a psilocybin retreat center in Jamaica where yeah. psychedelic mushrooms are, are legal. Yeah. So that's like my, my day job now. I'm not in Jamaica <laughs> right now, but I'll be flying back in a, about four or five days here um, where I work as a, as a psilocybin uh, facilitator is the name of, of, my, of, my, jo of my job title, uh, which means that I work with retreat guests uh, before, during, and after their psilocybin experience to provide a sense of safety and support and really optimize therapeutic outcomes in, in working with psilocybin. So yeah, that's a little bit about a uh, little bit about Jonas. Fantastic. I mean, I, I wasn't aware that you were sort of doing this sort of psilocybin uh, sitting kind of, kind of thing. I mean, that's a really interesting, you know, area. Cause I, I mean, I've spoken to other um, people who do a similar thing, like, um, there's a lady called Brigitte Mars. She sort of facilitates in the same way. So what's your, she, what's your, your goals, your, not your goals, but your method. Do you sort of, are you helping those who are doing it to sort of integrate in sort of a Jungian way? Are you, or are you helping them to go through to, you know, view past traumas and sort of make peace with them? Is there a, you know, a method to it or a, a process? Sure. Yeah. Well, there is a lot to be said <laughs> about that potentially, but let me try to break it down. So just as a little bit more background information, I work at a, at a retreat center called Myco Meditation. So it's not me working as an independent practitioner. I'm part of a team who offers retreats with uh, that are typically 10 to 12 people um, who uh, come on retreat together. And over the course of a week, there are three psilocybin dosing sessions and so the method or the process is uh really to walk side by side with the guests through every step of the way mm -hmm. so beforehand we're meeting as a circle and working at working as a group to uh prepare to really establish this sense of of trust and rapport uh and really communicate that um our presence there is meant to be a supportive, compassionate, empathetic one. There, it is not in our interest to judge or to uh, really. We are there to sort of create this container of of uh, security and support for whatever journey the guest is on, whether it's a healing one 
whether it's a spiritual one, whether it's a creative one, or more likely than not a combination of all of those and maybe other, other, other things as well. During the sessions themselves, uh, this is, a again, there's a lot to be said here, but really it's important to acknowledge that the, the mushroom itself is the medicine, right? It is the medicine, it is the therapist, it is the teacher, and us as the facilitation team are, uh, rather than be doing any sort of active or directive guidance, you know, this idea of a psychedelic guide, it's quite uh, conversely, it's more about getting out of the way as much as possible and creating this space that encourages the guests to really immerse their full attention inwardly, you know, in, in the experience themselves and really just, um, just, just almost let go of any worries or concerns of, of the mundane practical world, the external and really just go into this experience and commune with uh, the mushroom, commune with the medicine and commune with those deeper aspects of, uh, of the self, of the psyche, you know? And then of course, after these experiences, uh, there is this, this very, very important integration piece, which is, is really uh, the, I'm not gonna say it's the most important part because it's all the most important part and none of the parts is possible without the others. But um, in terms of leveraging these experiences into meaningful and lasting changes and healing in our everyday lives, this is what integration is, right? It's about using these experiences, using the insights and the wisdom and these new levels of awareness that we've gained in the experience and sort of uh, reflecting on what it means to integrate that, what it means to embody that wisdom mm -hmm. in our everyday life, you know, and that that is so, so important. And yeah, you mentioned Young. That's... <laughs> His all of Young's work is a, is of course a hugely important uh, piece of of throughout the process really, but certainly in integration. I mean, uh, th this idea of of shadow work and bringing awareness to these repressed or suppressed aspects of psyche that are deep, deep in our unconscious or subconscious, and go all the way back to our childhood. Um, tapping back into those deeper aspects of our psyche, bringing them into the light of awareness, even though those are often, you know, painful and uncomfortable memories, thoughts, and emotions, sometimes even terrifying, you know, horrifically painful traumas or what it, whatever it is. Um, these can, it can be incredibly difficult to revisit these core wounds deep in our psyche. Uh, but this, this sort of shadow work is really an unbelievable key to, in fact, I think it is the very foundation of the psychotherapeutic process is by, uh, by bringing more awareness to these unconscious dynamics of our being, we can release them in a way. We can get them unstuck. We can process them and allow those things to move through us so that we're lightening our load. You know, we're taking all this weight off our shoulders. We're taking the rocks out of our backpack. Like yeah. uh, so many of us are walking around with this backpack full of rocks and we don't even know it, you know, for <laughs> no reason. Like where are we bringing those rocks? You know, there's, there's this, uh, but the, the psychedelic experience, the psilocybin experience does for whatever reason, you know, and in a lot of ways, the way it works is, is mysterious, but it has this amazing capacity to sort of lower the threshold between the conscious and unconscious mind. All of this unconscious material almost floods into, into, into our consciousness, into the light of consciousness. And this is uh, an un, unbelievable uh, therapeutic opportunity. And a lot of the, a lot of guests, you know, um, come out of these psilocybin sessions and say that was like five years of therapy <laughs> in five hours, you know, because it's just all boom there, like front and center. And um, yeah, yeah. So it, so yeah, I mean, Young is definitely a very big, 
big part of it. I mean, I think an important part of, of the work that we are doing at this retreat center is that it's, it's really like an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approach where we try to meet the guests where they're at. You know, we offer different frameworks for understanding and processing these experiences, but certainly it's not ever part of our process or in our interest to impose a certain, mm. uh, a, a certain worldview or a certain certain spiritual or shamanic or religious framework saying like this is the right way to yeah. have your psychedelic experience and to understand or process your experience um, we really try to meet people where we're where they are at and offer different modalities or different frameworks different perspectives for working with with the psychedelic experience yeah and it's not it's really interesting hearing you describing it in the way that you are because you know, there's this common theme that I'm hearing, you know, with with other areas of consciousness where, you know, you're effectively, you know, there's this theme of empowerment, you are empowering, the, you know, these individuals to take control of their own past traumas, you know, like you said, to put awareness and attention inward so that they can actively be a part of their healing. And I guess not be a sort of passenger or a victim of it. You, you know, you're you're empowering them. And you know often with sort of western medicine you know people you can hear that you know people are given this magic pill to heal a pain or you're given this treatment and it will heal and there's you know a real lack of consciousness within that process you know mm -hmm. the, the the power has been given to someone else you know if i give you this treatment it will take away your pain or suppress right. it whereas you know really what you're describing is something so you know shamanic and you know it's so it's it just has that ancient feel of natural healing about it um just putting consciousness back into where it needs to be where it's been lost i think and perhaps we've been asleep for a while so. <laughs> <laughs> beautifully said you hit the nail on the head there that is that is such an important <laughs> insight like yeah i think it brings to mind uh this idea that was proposed by stanislav Graf. Mm -hmm who is just a, a legendary, sort of an OG in the, in the psychedelic uh, therapy space, uh, who worked with his wife uh, in the 70s in the, in the study. The, he, was a, he was a famous psychiatrist who worked with LSD-assisted uh, psychotherapy in the 70s, and then de developed this whole school of uh, holotropic uh, breath work when, that, uh, when psychedelic research got shut down. But anyways, he proposed this idea called uh, inner healing intelligence which is a beautiful idea that you were, you were touching on. Uh, and the way that I understand this is just in the same way that our bodies have a natural healing intelligence. You know, like if we get a cut, uh, there's nothing that I have to do to make this cut heal. I mean, you know, it will heal by itself, which is, which is quite a miracle. I mean, yeah. if you really think about it, like yeah. somehow the body, you know, has this, our cells have this natural intelligence, uh, knowing how to repair themselves and just in the same way those deeper aspects of our being our psyche also has this healing intelligence uh but here's the key point is that if we mess with the wound if we're constantly sticking our finger in the wound and uh or ripping the scab off you know <laughs> like that's not the, the most beautiful metaphor but there it is uh this is going to hinder the mm. healing process right yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, it's a question of how do we facilitate or how do we tap in to, um, into allowing this uh, natural healing intelligence to, to uh, run its natural course, right? And I think when it comes to um, psychological healing, mental and emotional, and perhaps even spiritual wounds, some, some people could understand them in that way as well. Uh, it's really about I think getting out of the way as much as possible on an individual level, while at the same time bringing our awareness to it. So like expand, expanding our inner awareness of these dynamics within us, right? Like this process of bringing a, a consciousness to these shadow aspects of our being yeah. and just that very, it, it also in a non-judgmental manner, right? Like that's what I meant by getting out of the way. Like the mind is sort of getting the mind, the egoic mind out of the way, which always has this impulse of judging or, or criticizing these aspects of our psyche, right? Like just setting that aside, which is 
you know, a lot of times in the psychedelic experience comes almost as a natural consequence is like, this is gone, right? The ego is gone and all of this material is coming up and we're bringing awareness to these things. And that very, it's not even an act. It's like a state of being of just allowing these things to flow through us and to move through us, allowing these emotions to run their course and really like just feeling these things in our body. This is tapping into the inner healing intelligence. This is how we heal ourselves. And this is the entire psychotherapeutic process. You know, whether we're using psychedelic substance or we're doing talk therapy, it's not the medicine or the therapist that is, these are catalysts for healing, but they're not where the healing is happening. The healing is happening within ourselves. It's like the psilocybin or the therapist or whatever modality we're using it is the facilitator of the healing. It's the catalyst. It's helping this healing process uh, flow, but ultimately all the, all the greatest healing forces in the universe are within every single one of us, period, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, so many things sort of triggered there, you know, when you, when you were talking about, you know, certain elements, like when, you, you know, you're saying about an old wound, you know, you don't keep playing with it or opening it, you know, it's, you know, it's those, those thoughts, isn't it? Those when you keep dwelling on a past event and, you know, you keep thinking about a trauma that happened, maybe, you know, even if you've suppressed it into your subconscious, but every night you're going back to that place and thinking about it. That's, that's kind of exactly, you know, what you're saying, you know, you're continually opening in that wound rather than letting sort of nature take care of it um so you know that, that was you know that's fascinating to hear you you know describing that um and what i i love as well about your you know about your channel and your work which is really reflecting in what you just described as well you know it, it, it sort of permeates everything you're talking about is that you know you do put sort of you know spirituality and you know the the healing process and you know the, you know the consciousness at the forefront of what you're what you're doing and what you're trying to do um and obviously psychedelics are a part of that but you know it's very clear that they are an aid uh, you know they're a doorway um they aren't the answer um whereas i think obviously sometimes for many people that are just starting you know it can psychedelics can be the art they can sort of perceive it to be the answer but i think it's really great that you know you're, you're very clearly not doing that and you know you're, you're very clear about that and i think that's great because it's it shows you know genuine passion and work as into what you're doing so thank you i appreciate that and yeah i mean it, it, it that really is such an important point right i i alan Watts has this quote that is it's kind of a famous quote but he says uh uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but he compares uh, like the use of psychedelics as a tool, just in the same way that a biologist uses a microscope to peer more deeply into the microscopic world, into the fabric of space time. Uh, the biologist doesn't spend all of their time looking through the microscope, you know, they, they, they look through the microscope and then they have to go at a certain point, they have to go away and work on their findings. Otherwise, what is the microscope for in the first place? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and he said, um, you know, when you get the message, hang up the phone. <laughs> and and, you know, I think in, in, in some ways I agree with that uh, with that idea. In some ways I do also disagree. Uh, I think there's like a little bit of nuance to it and everyone has is is unique on their own path of, of psychedelic exploration in my own experience uh psychedelics are a tool like a telescope or a microscope that we can use to uh a lens for inner exploration for for expanding our awareness of this mystery of consciousness which is an infinite ocean that we each have within yeah. us yeah. um but it's also like a, for, in my experience, it's been like somewhere between a therapist and a teacher and both for therapy and teaching. It's not like if you get the message, hang up the phone, it's like a collaborative relationship, right? Yeah. It's like, I'm going back to my team. I'm not going to just spend one day in a classroom. Yeah. The more that I visit the classroom, then the more that I can learn. But Again, I mean, like it's it's nuanced, you know. That's not to say that we should be taking uh, psychedelics like like going to class every single day, uh, yeah. uh, but that that's just to add some nuance to the idea of like when you get the message, hang up the phone. I mean, there's no one message to get. Yeah, there there is an infinite ocean, an infinite 
cosmos yeah. to be explored and and discovered you know and yeah i think this is a really really uh sort of the 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 one of the interests and and, and points that i'm most passionate about in this work is of course there is this tremendous uh therapeutic healing potential to psychedelics in so many different respects mm -hmm. and we're just beginning to scratch the surface there in a lot of ways you know like for a whole broad range of mental illnesses um the therapeutic efficacy is tremendous it is through the roof it is unlike any other psychiatric intervention that we currently know of it's a quantum leap from what we have right now. But that's only the start because like beyond the healing side of it, uh, there's also this whole other side to psychedelics where, or there's many sides to psychedelics where we can use these tools as tools for scientific discovery and exploration, where we are using these tools to unlock new discoveries about the mysteries of life and the cosmos and consciousness. Uh, some of life's biggest questions, you know, like substances like DMT reliably and repeatedly bring us to the very heart of some of life's greatest mysteries and skillful use of these substances can and already has and will continue to allow humanity to gain new perspectives, to gain mm. new uh, information and wisdom about what it means to be a human being in this infinite universe you know so mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's that's what uh that's what really fascinates me and what i do spend a lot of time on my youtube channel exploring uh is 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 what is what do these uh what do these what discoveries do these psychedelics unlock you know yeah and it's, it's interesting that you you know you went to the you know if you get the message hang up the phone you know that's something that you know often i th you know I, I think about that idea quite a lot especially when you know you, you hear people talking about that you know they go sort of quite high high dosage and go into one of these experiences and you know they come back and they you know either they were really scared or they have a really traumatic experience and you know and you just you think about it in terms of you know everyday life you know you don't go to you don't go to a rock concert for the first time having never seen rock music go and get plastered, go and go to this rock concert with no context, understanding the music, the type of people that are there. You don't go and throw yourself in and then come out of that saying, wow, I know everything about rock. You right. Know, it's probably right. the first experience and you're sort of like the shock, you've got to get over the sort <laughs> of the shock factor. And I think like you say, right. it's really important to, uh, you know, you need to keep possibly going back to the classroom. You don't need to go in, at, you know, blowing yourself into a, you know high dimensions you can do that i'm sure you know at points as well but you know you, you can be responsible with it like you say and you can dip your toes over a period of time and get yourself used to it and understand what it is you're perceiving um because i think sometimes you know like you say some people can go straight in have that terrible experience which i think perhaps is what some people have when they're you know in many ayahuasca retreats and things like that and you know high doses of mushrooms they have that one experience which can be quite traumatic um, and don't go back and don't, you know, perhaps do it in a, a, a more held back way, unless, you know, you can sort of dip your toes and then build up from there. And, you know, you can be rational and sort of scientific about it until you get a, a fuller understanding of what is essentially a different modality of consciousness, you know? Yes. Um, it's such an important point. And yeah, I mean, no matter how experienced a psychonaut is, uh, there's always, 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 every single time that we visit these non-ordinary states of consciousness, there's always the potential for something truly shocking, destabilizing, potentially terrifying uh, to happen, you know? And we always need to approach this experience with that sense of respect and understand what it means to navigate that possibility, that potential with safety, you know, because I mean, of course, that's that's number one is 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 being safe throughout throughout the psychedelic experience. Um, I another comparison that I often use is like, you know, cars are amazingly powerful tools for getting us from point A to point B. But if you get behind the driver wheel and you don't know what you're doing or you go straight onto the highway, <laughs> 
this can be catastrophic. Absolutely. Like this can really be a terrible and um, life or death in the worst, you know, in the worst scenario uh, situation. So like it, it has to be uh, understood and respected that these are unbelievably immensely powerful, uh, powerful substances. And so for sure there, there needs to be, um, and this is, I think it's, it's really important in this day and age when psychedelics are, are seeing this sort of revival of interest that there needs to be a, uh, increasing, there is an increasing need for psychedelic education and awareness about how to approach this experience in a way that not only optimizes the experience, but, you know, uh, keeps us safe throughout the process. And that doesn't mean figuring out ways to not have a bad trip because these, these challenging experiences are part of the experience and they're, they're going to arise from time to time. Like that's just part of the experience. And not only is it part of the, of the experience, it's, I would contend that these more often than not, these so-called bad trip, good trip, they're, Oh, we lost you for a moment there. So. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. That's all right. No problem. Um, yeah. So I, I just, to, just to finish that thought, I do think that, you know, you know, like, especially working in the, in, at that psychedelic retreat center has really just sort of emphasized this idea that uh, I'm not sure I believe in such a thing as a bad trip anymore because these mm. challenging experiences more often than not, uh, yield the most significant healing and growth and evolution, because this is when we're visiting our shadow. This is when we're visiting these sh yeah. shadow aspects of our being. And that's not always a fun, that's not always a fun ride, right? <laughs> like yeah. to say the least, it can be terrifying and, and even, even hellish potentially. But if there are the right, if there is the right, um, you know, set and setting and support, social support, integration support around those experiences, very, almost always these are these are massive opportunities for healing and growth and evolution and even for you know very advanced psychonauts or or i don't know if that's the right word but people who have a lot of experience with psychedelics you know it's important to recognize that if and when these ch challenging or, or terrifying uh experiences arise this is a gold mine for learning more mm -hmm. about our psyche and about ourselves mm -hmm. like we have to we have to we have to use this opportunity to learn and to grow, you know, and because there's, there's, there is a reason that that experience arose and it's pointing to some aspects of our being, which the spiritual ego or the psycho not ego would like to pretend doesn't exist within us. Mm -hmm. But of course it's, these are blind spots within us. Right. And so by, by uncovering these blind spots, this is how we level up. Yeah, it's so true as well you know again this is i'm you know i'm a definitely i'm a firm believer there are no bad trips you know it's it, the bad experience is it's a lesson it's it's teaching you something and you know there's a massive synchronicity there i was reading you know i was reading a book by a phd uh, lady called rachel harris i think it was and she you know did lots of experiments with ayahuasca and discovering things about herself um you know and one of her you know, there's a, there's a particular story she tells, which, you know, she tells it really well because you're convinced, you know, that she's of what she's saying. And she's, she described this experience where, you know, I think it was her probably about her 10th ayahuasca experience. Um, and she'd had a really bad experience, you know, going down to the to, you know, to see the shaman. And she had these overwhelming bad feelings because there was issues with money and things that were being talked about and all these things fed into her. And she said that during her experience, she, you know, even though she had a friend there who was, you know, completely, you know, hadn't take, taken any substance, she was sort of there looking after her and stuff. She had this overwhelming feeling that the shaman were, you know, going to do something bad to her. Um, and, you know, she felt really, you know, just this really strong feeling and it was it felt so real and she thought it was a really negative experience and she said 
you know, the way she subscribes is brilliant because you, you are with her, you are convinced, you know, about these feelings and you're like, yeah, so she's definitely had a bad time and these, you know, people are obviously out to get her and, and do all sorts of bad things. And she said it, the, the beautiful thing about sort of ayahuasca and the experience is that it took her six months to, to pull apart what was happening in that lesson that she was being given and that all these, you know, she managed to bring out all these sort of repressed, repressed feelings about her, you know, an inner hatred towards certain types of men and, you know, things that she'd picked up from her childhood and they'd always been there and they sort of just floated back in like that beautiful lesson that, you know, ayahuasca, once you, mm. you take it, it doesn't just, you know, you don't instantly have that lesson sometimes do it. It can take months before you understand what it meant. Um, yeah. And she said all these, she said, I, she realized that these, all these shaman were trying to do was help her. You know, and they actually even went out of their way because they could see she was having a bad time to help her and give her stuff and, you know, give her special attention. And, you know, she could see that it was all these repressed feelings and it really sort of helped change her mindset. So, you know, the bad trip sometimes, like you say, is sometimes a very deep, deep lesson that perhaps our brain doesn't want to understand or the ego doesn't quite want to understand it when, you know, when it first occurs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, in, in working with, uh, you know, the, these, these substances and, and hearing stories like this quite, quite regularly, I've really come to see, uh, and this is more of the mystical side of Jonas speaking, but I've really come to see these substances as having an intelligence, mm -hmm. um, as having, uh, as being tool or at least as being tools for a greater intelligence to come through. Um, because it's almost like very reliably, these substances are doing a full scan of our system on every level, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, going all the way back to our earliest childhood. And who knows, maybe even before that. Yeah. Um, and pinpointing the key issues to serve up an experience that is optimally conducive to our healing and growth in a way that's even outside of time, right? Like it's yeah. not, it, it, it's, 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 it's amazing to see how this, <laughs> how this works and happens. Yeah. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think uh, scientifically and explicable for at least from the materialist perspective, um, it's incredible. Yeah, I bet. Oh, fantastic. Well, something I really, really wanted to talk to you about, you know, while we're talking about sort of ayahuasca and DMT, you know, I, I love the, you know, some of the videos you've done um, with regards to, you know, DMT uh, entities and, but also the sort of statistics, you know, where surveys have been sort of undertaken to, you know, see you know what whether people think these things are real whether they think yes. it's you know aliens or spirits or you know i just wanted to ask you about that really and you know of your own experience you know where you sort of sit is it something spiritual is it is it an archetype of the brain is it um is it aliens you know or does it just purely all of those things and it just depends on your cultural lens you know wh where's your standpoint okay. uh yes <laughs> to all of the above. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I have more questions than answers myself. Yeah. Um, even after having explored this for nearly a decade of my life and having, you know, directly experienced uh, DMT states of consciousness, DMT realms on dozens of occasions. Um, it's such a complex and nuanced thing that and, and, and it, in, in a lot of ways, it evades all understanding. Uh, so like, I, I think it's, it's helpful to sort of like, you know, start with an over overview of the DMT experience a little bit and how these entities play in. So uh, at the high dose, at the high, a high dose DMT experience is commonly referred to as a breakthrough experience. And I'm, I'm sure you are familiar with most, if not all of this, but just for the sake of, of the audience and the discussion, sure. Um, it's commonly referred to as a breakthrough experience because it literally feels as though consciousness has left the body or soul or spirit or awareness or life force, whatever you want to call it, has left the body and broken through into some different 
reality or a different level of reality, a different dimension and alternate realm that typically feels transcendent, non-material beyond this physical universe outside of space and time, uh, profoundly sacred. And not only that, on top of all that, it feels more real than this reality. And, uh, you know, in the, in, in the work of Dr. Rick Strassman, for example, who uh, did one of the original and the most well-known DMT studies at the University of New Mexico. I actually just interviewed him on my channel, which was like an unbelievable uh, experience to speak with him because I had really looked up to him for a long time. But uh, this was one of the most in in incredible findings of his research was that almost every single person who was dosed with DMT came back and said, I don't know what that was, but it was more real than this lifetime. <laughs> And, and like the consistency of that is, 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 is remarkable. Um, another one of the most surprising findings is these, these entity encounters. Uh, so one of the, mo I mean, there's an incredibly broad range of DMT experiences, you know, like it really almost evades, uh, you know, sort of like a general general generalizations or, mm. or 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 a broad uh, characterization because, you know, yeah, there's just such such a broad range. But one of the most consistent factors that recurs in all these different experiences are these entity encounters, where when we arrive in these alternate realms or dimensions of existence, these higher planes, uh, um, we find that they are inhabited. We find that there are beings there, there are entities who seem to exist autonomously outside of our brain. They don't seem to be a hallucinate or subjectively, they certainly don't feel like they are a hallucination in the brain. They seem to be real. They exist outside of us. They are intelligent. And not only that, but they are massively intelligent in many cases. Um, and they communicate with us. We can commune with them. We can we can exchange information with them. This is an incredible finding. <laughs> Modern science needs to pay attention to this. Like we need to explore this desperately, and it's happening. But uh, I digress. Uh, the what's so, interesting sorry, is that just just quickly. So just to check. Would you include ayahuasca? You know, DMT experiences within, within the DMT experience entity experience or would you just purely talk about dmt experiences uh that's a good question yes i would include yes i would include uh ayahuasca i speaking from my own experience i don't have nearly as much experience with ayahuasca as dmt um so i can't speak as much from my own experience there i know that in a large portion of ayahuasca experiences people do have a similar entity type experiences where they seem to be communicating with spiritual intelligence um, or even with ayahuasca, the, the spirit of ayahuasca herself or itself. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, you know, affectionately call this grandmother ayahuasca. Um, so yes, absolutely. I do include ayahuasca in, in that, but there is also at the same time, I do think DMT has a little bit like of a unique uh, just in terms of the sheer intensity uh, and and the rapidity, like how rapid the shift in consciousness is, that you're like launched out of out of out of your body into this into these into these other realms. Um, I think there's more similarities than differences. There's more overlap, but it's somehow. I mean, again, this is just my subjective experience, but uh, DMT does seem to be uh, to offer a unique experience in some ways mm. um, with these encounters with uh, you know beings who and there's also a broad range of of uh entities that are encountered so, encountered some seem to be these uh uh heavenly divine angelic beings you know spiritual energy light beings some can be on the opposite end of the spectrum where they're these like malevolent or dark or demonic entities there are these machine elves, these sort of <laughs> mischievous uh, elfish or jester-like creatures. In some cases, there are, um, you know, what seem to be extraterrestrial or extra-dimensional beings. Uh, and in some cases, you know, bizarrely enough, I've had DMT experiences where it felt like I had entered, 
I was, it, it was essentially like I was, I was, I had a bird's eye view flying over another planet where there were beings, there were cities, there was neighborhoods, there was like all, all these, all these beings there that were just living out their life. Like <laughs> I flew by and they looked up and saw me and like waved and were all excited to see me, you know, but, uh, uh, they were just going about their thing. They were just like living their lives on, or on whatever, wherever that was or whatever that was. Um, so all that is to say that there's a very, very large range of entity encounters, like just all the same diversity of life that we see here on planet Earth, project that outward into the cosmos, into the interdimensional cosmos and multiply it by like 100 trillion. And like, that's the potential like, like diversity that we have in these DMT realms. So it's important to acknowledge that when we're talking about DMT entities, this is not just one creature or one being or one expression of life there is an infinite diversity there. So again, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, generalize about this. As to the reality of these, of these uh, or maybe that's even like a step too far from where, from where the conversation has gone, like the nature or, or what are these creatures? Like, are they aspects or like archety archetypal aspects of, hmm. our, of our psyche, of our consciousness? Um, are they purely, you know, chemically induced hallucinations as, as mainstream science would tell us? Uh, I think absolutely not. I think that in, at least in some cases, I'm not going to say universally, at least in some cases, I do think that this represents an encounter with some sort of intelligence that is real, that does exist autonomously and outside outside of our uh you know physio physiology inner experience but in in another paradoxical way is part of what we are also a part of there's a deeper so, unity yeah. that runs through all of this experience and i do think that all of these beings or entities are manifestations ultimately of the same fabric the same underlying reality that all of us are a part of right um there's even a deeper question as to like it, when exploring the nature of these uh, entities. I mean, I think that like one hypothesis that I've been thinking a lot about recently and that I think is very, very compelling is that uh, there are. It's, 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 it's hard to it's hard to talk about this in some ways, but I do think that it kind of brings me to uh, some of uh, Dr. Rick Strassman's work who wrote about prophetic states of consciousness and which was like really interesting to me because like, you know, in, in studying the psychedelic experience, everyone's talking about mystical experiences mm -hmm. of unity and oneness, uh, which is a big part of this, the psychedelic experience, but there's another kind of spiritual non-ordinary state of consciousness called prophetic states of consciousness where that aren't characterized as much by this like cosmic unity and oneness with all of life. These are interactive and relational experiences. And this is why Dr. Strassman kind of went to like move towards exploring prophetic states of consciousness because all these DMT volunteers in his research weren't talking about like cosmic unity and oneness with all things. I mean, there were one or two cases of that, but not as common as these reports of encountering entities and having these sort of interactive uh, relationships or exchanges with this sort of entity that's over here and I'm over here, you know, in some ways. Yeah. Um, and so he sort of landed on prophecy as, as there, there are in old religious texts, right? Like for example, the old, old Testament, there are all these prophetic experiences like, uh, you know, famously in, in the book of Ezekiel, uh, there, there's this instance where Ezekiel, who's like a prophet in, in the old Testament describes these uh divine messengers who come down from the sky and he has this like exchange they exchange information so there's a connection here between some of the uh what we find in old uh religious scriptures what we experience in dmt states and then there's other pieces as well like for example the whole ufo phenomenon <laughs> uh, i think that there are really really compelling um interconnections between all these things right mm -hmm. but i bring up that idea to say that I believe it's possible 
that these entities or beings that we're encountering in these experiences are a messenger or a form that some sort of higher intelligence, like a formless intelligence, assumes in the experience in order to elicit a certain response and perhaps as a messenger to convey certain information, right? So that, that, that possibility is that this entity that we're encountering in the DMT experience is more than just this one entity. It's, it's, it's a uh, manifestation of a deeper underlying non-physical intelligence, infinite intelligence that is temporarily assuming this form in, if you even want to call it that, like uh, immaterial form in that in that experience in order to elicit a certain response from us and engage in this interaction, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's a really, really compelling and interesting idea that, um, you know, there are maybe some of these entities are like actual beings, actual creatures that are inhabiting other realms, planes of existence and going about their thing and we just kind of pop in and have this encounter and then pop out and they continue onwards doing their thing. But it's also possible that, and, and I think like probably in some cases, it's all of this. It's not just like one or the other. It's not like a binary thing. It's like all the possibilities are on the table, right? Um, Cause this isn't constrained or limited by rationality. It's not yeah. like constrained by space, time, linear thinking, none of that. It's outside, it's, it's transcendent. So um, do you ever think of the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, these different modalities of consciousness when we're talking, you know, a lot of people don't like to go down the oneness of the unity route. And, you know, there's a lot of people sort of, going on about new age all the time which you know i think is a really bad label because it's it the new age sort of term really doesn't cover you know it's too general and too you know ambiguous for me it's you know and it sort of discredits a lot of you know philosophies that have been around for centuries and longer um, and they seem to get banded into the same new age category but when sort of we talk about one sort of oneness and consciousness it's interesting earlier that you mentioned something about, again, going back to when you were talking about the cut, you know, if you, if you cut yourself and there is an intelligence that we aren't actively involved in that heals that, you know, and when you think about that oneness, that that, that, that conscious, there's obviously some sort of part of consciousness that's, that's part of you that is involved in that process. And when we go to these different states, you know, even when you're dreaming and you're in a different, you know, wavelength, you know, your, your consciousness is still the bit that's gone there. And I wonder whether these, you know, experiences sometimes are still part of the oneness in that maybe we could be subjected to the intelligence in the cut in the hand, that we could be meeting the intelligences that are just doing that tiny little microcosmic job of healing your, you know, the hand, the, you know, the cut on your hand. And that's why it's so hard to understand and perceive. And, you know, maybe when we go into these you know, some people have, I've spoke to, you know, a lady called Kimber Rem, and she talks about, she's actually measured, uh, you know, the uh, sort of the frequency that people go into in deep states of meditation, you know, when they've taken ayahuasca, and also when, you know, people play, when she plays the, you know, the didgeridoo, she manages to go into a gamma state, so, mm. and that's like quite a common theme with, you know, the psychedelics, that there's this gamma frequency, and you are sort of moving our consciousness into that frequency and experiencing those intelligences that are actually part of us, but we just haven't made a full connection to. I mean, I, I'm an amateur in this, and but that, that's something that always stood out to me when I'm dipping my toes in these experiences. And I just wondered what you, whether that was something that was sort of coming through from what you were talking about. Yes, yes. Uh, that's a really interesting observation. And again, there's a lot to be said there. I think that, you know, it's interesting, like, some of my when when I, when I came out of these sort of DMT states, like in, in one experience in particular, what uh, sort of just spontaneously came to me was the idea of like, the divine clockwork. Like this was how I would like the, the phrase or idea that came to mind for me, understanding what I had just witnessed or just experienced. It seemed like all of the uh, subtle 
infinitely complex and infinitely beautiful and elegant processes that underlie the functioning of uh, life and reality. Like, I mean, every single one of us is a living, breathing miracle, right? That is just unbelievably, <laughs> infinitely complex, trillions and trillions of cells, each with their own evolutionary agenda coming together with seamlessly, beautifully to form this uh, perfectly functioning machine system. <laughs> it is unbelievable. Absolutely. And, and I do think that is reflective of this sort of infinite intelligence of life right but in in for whatever reason and this is this is reported quite often in psychedelic or non-ordinary states of consciousness is that it seems that we are visiting this divine clockwork where we're we can almost perceive in a new way all of these underlying processes that are giving rise to this life emergence and definitely what's what's weird and interesting is as you said like i do think that some of these like entity encounters are taking place on that level you know like it almost seemed like there are beings who are sort of like tinkering around and like you know like sort of overseeing the the functioning the the of of all this uh underlying clockwork you know yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's an interesting interesting observation absolutely um and so you know you've got psychedelic experiences and near-death experiences you know deep meditation they're all essentially different sort of modalities of consciousness why do you think we gravitate towards this material dense state why do you think it is that we without deep meditation and things why we are so stuck in in this sort of very singular um, one-dimensional sort of state of being oh that is a brilliant question uh i think in some ways like your guess is as good as mine <laughs> i have no i don't idea. think I, I don't yeah and and that's that is to say that ultimately i don't have any idea but i can give you some of what i perceive to be true it hasn't always been this way. Our ancestors, the ancients, they knew. Yeah. They knew they were, in some ways, they were more wise than we were. They knew the sacredness of life. They knew that we are spiritual beings in, in, a, in a physical human lifetime. They were connected to nature, to mother earth, to the planets, to, to, to the planet and, and the stars, the cosmos. Um, and so, I think the question is what happened? Like, where did we go wrong? Where did we lose that, you know? Yeah. And uh, why now are we stuck in this sort of materialist paradigm? At the same, that is to say that I don't think we're stuck. And I do think that there's like these seismic movements in consciousness that are happening right now where we are moving as a, as a collective in, in a new direction. It towards like a reconnection with spirit and the sacredness of life, a massive collective spiritual awakening in some ways. Uh, like this is a long term process, you know, and and I. I uh, yeah, in some ways, that's that's just my belief or my perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's like scientifically factually true. It's just how I see it. But um I don't know. I mean, what, what, what happened there? Like, I, I think there's a lot of different factors. Like uh, when you look at the structure of power in the world, hmm. pointing to uh, uh, socioeconomic and political and also religious institutions, the way that they um, uh, social engineered humanity in, hmm. in, 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 in some, in some ways to uh lose touch of this this sacred knowledge of knowing that we are all like divine infinite powerful creators you know um i don't know there's there's a lot to be said and there's 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 a lot to untangle there i think that in some ways too like there was a a move away from uh a sort of blind faith in religion if you want to call it that and a move towards uh scientific materialism or, or this sort of reductionist way of thinking that in some ways, maybe you, we could trace back to like this, uh, you know, ironically, it's called the enlightenment uh, period, uh, where more and more people became, uh, people started to 
uh, resonate with the idea that we can understand the mechanisms of 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 the cosmos and 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 in, in some ways it was like it was this idea of the clockwork of all things right if we like look like look on a smaller and smaller scale as well as a larger and larger scale we can understand how all of these like uh all of these constituent parts of reality come together and function under a set of laws that are scientifically uh, measurable, quantifiable, understandable to the rational mind. And then we can understand uh, the entire history of the universe, as well as the future traje trajectory of life in the universe. And in some ways that that uh, strictly scientific or materialist view started to grow and grow and grow right at the expense of like this connection with with divinity or, or, or with, uh, spirit. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think, I mean, there's something I often, I probably need to change my thinking on it. Cause I, I, I think I'm a bit stagnant in this area. I, I, do you think there's, you know, this birth of the ego may have something to do with it, that ego, as much as most people a lot of people we wouldn't want to admit of you know having a you know a big ego and you know I, I will sort of humbly admit even though I you know I'm at a certain point in my life I still have an ego he's still there I still have to rein him in I still have to give him you know a good beating now and then um do you think that perhaps like you say where this where it was lost where that knowledge was lost that you know our ancestors knew that it was the birth of some sort of ego consciousness in itself that has not left and it's just taken control, you know, and it's, you know, a, a very ego, we live in an absolutely sort of ego dominated world now with, you know, Facebook and, you know, big tech and, you know, people living for their image and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I always wonder if that was something to do with it. And I, I personally know that the heart of all my problems will always come, always come back to him, that ego. It always, it, I can always find him meddling there at the middle if I've, you know, you know, got problems in my life, you know. So. It's a, it's a really, really uh, good point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, what another way of saying that we've lost our connection to sacredness or to spirit is that we, the only connection we have is the egoic one, right? Like the ego is, I mean, people often describe it as like uh, the, that deeper essence as like the sun in the sky, but then the ego, like all these thoughts in the mind, the conditioned mind is like the clouds that pass uh, in front of the sun and we lose sight of the sun, but the sun is still there, of course, but it's just, you know, yeah. clouded over. I love um, that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and yes, absolutely. I mean, in some ways, you know, I think that this is an inevitable part of the the evolutionary process of humanity was this sort of rise in ego consciousness, this sort of differentiation as we moved into great uh, social orders of greater complexity. It's almost like there has to be uh, greater increasing levels of ego so that there's like a hierarchical structure for overseeing social complexity, right? But it has really, so in some ways, I think it's in an inevitable part of human evolution, but in other ways, like it has exploded out of control with um, uh, in, like capitalism, for example, mm -hmm. really has driven this sort of competitive me versus you yeah. i need to collect and accrue as much wealth and resources and status as i can for myself at the expense of everyone else and at the expense of of the planet that gives us life and sustains us as well um so it has become a very sort of competitive and ego driven uh uh way of organizing society and humanity and 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 understanding what gives life meaning too. you know like man's search for meaning mm -hmm. uh, it could be something that's so much more beautiful and profound than the collection of material wealth and yet that seems to be for the most part where modern western society is right now is that our the way that we organize our lives on an individual and collective level is around uh, is always going to be around a pursuit of meaningful and significant lives. But the way that is like uh, manifests in today's world is 
give me, I need to get as much wealth and material status or whatever as I can for myself. And so I think you're right. Like that has given rise to this, like, uh, um, you know, just, just, just explosion of, uh, hyper egoic behaviors and way of ways of living and operating and then of course there those are filtered down uh as new people are born into this world we assume in many ways we are conditioned we are programmed uh not necessarily in a bad or 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 in a malevolent way it's just like a natural consequence of living with parents who are living their lives in this certain way who have been taught to live their lives in this certain way by their parents by their parents and on and on and on you know so there is this like uh um uh it's like a self-replicating or like a self-propagating sort of sort of system of sociocultural uh ways of thinking and understanding the world right but uh, I do believe that there are, there is like evolution is the, is the law of life, right? Every, the, everything in the universe is always unfolding, is always evolving. Sure. Uh, sometimes that's a creative act and sometimes that's a destructive act, but it's always changing. Right. And uh, on the collective human uh, level right now and mother earth as a system, Gaia, there is this, uh, I do believe that there is this like, evolution that's happening right now that is moving us away from this kind of purely materialist and egotistical way of of living as individuals and as a collective and towards sort of a reconnection with with uh with uh yeah the sacredness of life with spirit it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because that's something i actually you know i wanted to ask you about you know the world last year was pretty chaotic you know and viruses and you know polarization and crazy elections and people divided more than ever the need for people to feel individual more than ever is really taking hold people want to be different to each other um, more than ever rather than trying to see the similarities in each other um, what do you think consciousness is trying to tell us here as the trauma and the the things kind of are building up do you think we're over it now or do you think there is more to come and what do you think consciousness is doing? What's the, what's the, you know, I think you touched on it a little bit there, you know, and what you were saying and that we're moving away from it, but well, give us your thoughts. So, uh, where to begin there? Yes. Okay. So there, uh, I mean, it wasn't just 2020, right? It was like the past few decades have Absolutely. been, yeah. uh, this movement. I mean, this, this is just great upheaval around the world so uh socially politically economically um and uh, quite frankly uh an emer emerging crises right like uh in in many many sense senses in terms of uh the climate in terms of social inequality in terms of uh injustice uh racism all these different things the, there there are the emergence of these crises um which crises are opportunities for massive transformation crises uh as as things break down they represent the opportunity for a breakthrough the way that i always compare this to is like the metaphor of a caterpillar metamorphosizing into a butterfly this is a miraculous process the caterpillar enters the chrysalis and essentially dissolves into a chemical liquid soup. And before, and, and in that sense, the caterpillar has to die off in a way. It has to dissolve, it has to break down in order to open up the opportunity for a quantum leap, for this, for the butterfly to emerge, right? And the butterfly could never have emerged if not for the breakdown of the caterpillar. Now, that's like a vast oversimplification. But I think in some ways, what we are seeing is the breakdown of old uh, social, economic, political structures, ways of being, ways of living. We now know that the way things are is not working out for humanity. I mean, for the tiniest like 1%, it's working out great. But for 99 percent of people on the planet 
it's not working out. Mental health is, there's a mental health crisis. Rates of depression and anxiety are skyrocketing uh, in, t in, in spite of having more material comfort than we've ever had before. And not only is it not working for us, for humans, it's not working for our planet, for mm. our home. Like we need, we need evolution. We need a mass shift in consciousness. I believe that's the only thing that over the long term will save humanity from total self annihilation. Like as crazy as that is, we are now in a race between consciousness and catastrophe. If we don't evolve, we will self-destruct. And like, you know, that sounds like a, a, a super pessimistic and dark thing to say. But like, if you look at the, you know, climactic conditions, like this is how it is. And so I think in some ways, this is where all of the social upheaval that we're seeing in the world. It's a reflection of where humanity is at in our collective evolution, you know, as well as a catalyst. It's a driving force. All this conflict and crisis is a driving force for further evolution because we we're, we're kind of a stubborn species in some ways. Like we're not going to change our ways of being unless we have no other choice. And now it's reaching the point where we have no other choice. Like we really have to change things. And I do think, again, like I mentioned earlier, sort of this more mystical side of, of me, my, my thinking, like I do, I, I am scientific and rational, but then I think that uh, there are also transcendent forces at play here that are way beyond, like we're only seeing the surface manifestations of it. There is a deeper shift. There is a deeper movement inwardly in in our collective consciousness and this is the outer manifestation this is where we're this is what we're seeing i believe that mother earth gaia is also going through this sort of evolutionary process with us and all of this is happening in divine timing as far as i see it uh this is a it's no accident it is no accident that all of these crises, this confluence of all these like crazy social issues are emerging on the planet right now is because this is both a sign of evolution as well as a driving force of further evolution. And, you know, on another level, like we can see it in the, in the, you know, like not only, I think a lot of people inwardly, those who are on sort of this path of spiritual exploration and discovery can feel inwardly that there is something momentous here that is that is transpiring. Mm -hmm. There is something deeply significant in a way that's hard to even understand mm -hmm. with the mind. We can feel it mm -hmm. in our hearts. We know this is happening and we can see it in the people around us. More and more and more people are waking up in a way that's totally unprecedented. And, uh, you know, part of it is credit to the internet, to YouTube, to this proliferation of wisdom and information. But uh, more and more people are waking up, and that is the ultimate driving force of, of evolution. It's not, uh, you know, changing things on sort of an external level, like changing the political order or social order or even the economic order, whatever. Uh, it really is this inner process of consciousness that as more and more people are going through their inner journey of evolution and awakening and tapping into higher states of consciousness – and bringing that into their lifetimes, that has a ripple effect. That is just as contagious as any virus. Yeah. That filters outwards and affects, it touches the people around us. And, you know, ultimately, I, I, I do see humanity as not just us as individuals, but also as a collective. We're a collective consciousness, right? And on, on, a, on a deeper level, outside of what we can even directly perceive, the way our state of being, our inner state of consciousness has a ripple effect on the, is, is a meaningful and significant contribution to the collective, to the collective consciousness. So again, as more and more people are going through this process of awakening, it's like, it's going to reach, it, it, it already is starting to reach this sort of infection point or this tipping point where it's going to accelerate. And I think that there is going to be this mass uh, shift, this mass transformation of consciousness, not as like a single event, but as an ongoing process that continues for the rest of, for the rest of humans, uh, you know, humanity's 
future, you know, but it's this idea that that world peace begins with e within each one of us. <laughs> this whole global shift in consciousness begins within each one of us. And more and more people are waking up right now. Uh, and thank God, thank, thank life, because <laughs> we, we need it. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. You said that, you know, right at the end, where you, you emphasize that it's, you know, world peace starts inside, you know, and I think that goes right back to what we were talking about, you know, with the work that you're doing in Jamaica, and, you know, teaching people to apply their own consciousness and be their own healers, you know, that's exactly it, isn't it? That is the, the theme that permeates everything it is people becoming responsible for their own joy, their own healing, not externalizing these things and giving your power away essentially to whatever these forces are, whatever they are. I don't want to put a label on it because I'm, I don't like to pretend that I know because I don't, <laughs> but whatever it is, whether it's an ego consciousness or a pharmaceutical company or a, you know, a fast food restaurant where you allow someone to cook your food for you and then wonder why you've got diabetes or have a heart attack in 10 years you know it's, it's it's that bit that's taking responsibility for your own conscious consciousness and awareness and healing so yeah i think that was really beautifully put so thank you thank you <laughs> well i'm I think that we've you know covered loads there i'm really happy with with um what we've done there is there anything you know particularly you want to any specific topic you wanted to talk about or there any specific thing that's happening in the near future that you wanted to talk about? Thanks for asking. I mean, no, not in particular. I, that was, that was really like a fantastic conversation. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, there are so many different like branches or avenues of exploration yeah. that we, we could continue. I mean, I'm happy to keep the conversation going if, if you would like, but I, I, I think that was also like a really fantastic conversation we covered some good ground um yeah i mean i'm quite happy to close there and i would absolutely love to talk to you again i think it's nice isn't it when it's because it, it, it flows so perfectly and then you know you, you might end off go we may both end up going in it gets to that point doesn't it so you mm -hmm. know I, I think that was a wonderful conversation and I, i'd love to talk to you again um because you know it was it was brilliant and i think some of this some of the stuff you've you've shared with us tonight is so insightful and so important um, so I really appreciate that you've, you know, you've come and done that. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, I would love to have another conversation anytime. It was, it was really a pleasure. I can, I can tell that you're, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're both exploring a lot of the same material and, and share a lot of the same sort of perspectives and, and, and insights. And, and this is important to be discussing this stuff right now, right? Because again, it is this idea that like, uh, through our individual explorations and through our individual uh, uh, processes, it's a chain reaction, right? Like we're all interconnected and it like kind of facilitates greater healing and wisdom and awareness in, in other people as well as ourselves. Like um, it's always a, it's always a great learning experience uh, yeah. Yeah. To, to, to have these conversations, I think, and to listen to these conversations. So yeah, yeah, it was, it was an absolute pleasure. Yeah, great. No, and it's like we were saying earlier, isn't it? Because our individual consciousness is so limited and it's 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 nice to be open-minded and hear someone else's perspective and, you know, experiences. And there's just little things that pop out and sometimes they're, you know, you can see where they're similar to other experiences. And sometimes like today, there are experiences that were both similar and also completely insightful that I've not heard before. And I'm sure some of the people that, that watch this will, you know, be like, wow, I've not heard that perspective before. That's great. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it's that being open-minded, isn't it? It's when you close your mind off and you stick to one set of beliefs, it's, um, it can lead down a bad way. Even, even if it's got a good intention, it can still keep you stuck and stop you evolving as you were, you were talking about evolution. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good stuff. Well, great, man. And yeah, well, thank you so much for coming on, you know, Shaman Shed, you've been so humble. You've given us so much, you know, insight into, you know, cosmic consciousness um but yeah i will absolutely like to speak to you again if you're up for it and uh, something we can arrange in you know maybe the coming the coming weeks and and stuff like that